I'm Paula Eddy Wilcox and welcome to this episode of Game of Leadership, the podcast for curious leaders. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at the leadership journey of our guest and what unique traits bring them to be the leader they are today. Who knows what we're going to discover together, so I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, welcome to today's episode of Game of Leadership, the podcast for curious leaders. And I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Emma Deshu, leadership coach and professional extraordinaire, I think is a, a pa- perhaps a good way to introduce you. Is that all right, Emma? That sounds good to me, Paul. Thank <laughs> you. Good to be here. Oh, so lovely to have you. And um, we've been trying to get together for some time and I'm so delighted that we've managed it today. Although almost the tech was against us, but we powered through and um, managed to to get there. (laughs) So I'm just going to do a quick introduction of um, Emma and forgive me because I will read this because I always like to make sure I get this right for our guests. So Emma inspires you to achieve results through her coaching workshops and programs. She started her training and coaching business, Inspired Leadership, four and a half years ago after building her career, where she started out in a sewing factory, so much to ask you about that, (laughs) on a piece of work that led to gaining 14 years experience in corporate training roles and leading large teams in retail, healthcare and facilities management inspired learning, work with clients globally, both face-to-face and virtually. And Emma has recently joined forces with a lady who I'm sure you'll know the name of if you've been following the podcast for some time, Jodie Salt, and another lady called Claire Smith to create the Leading Ladies Society, a membership club that inspires career and business women to evolve together. That sounds amazing. Oh, there's so much to talk about. Welcome, Emma. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, good to be here. It's always good for when we have a chat together. So really looking forward to chewing the fat with you, Paula. Oh, oh brilliant. I love it. <laughs> and there's, there's so much um, that we get to dig into and um, we never know where where the discussion's going to go in these sessions. I don't think I've had any one podcast. And we're already at episode 25 that's been been anywhere near similar um everybody's bringing their uniqueness and that's that's you know an absolute joy for me in doing this because I know that you're going to bring your superb uniqueness today Emma in all that you're going to share and as we know today is all about um your leadership story and um where you've come from how you've got to be um the leader you are today because uh, it takes some time to build that and um, whilst we're not super old ladies we are building our experience a bit getting on a little bit and able to bring lots of fab experience so I'd, I'd love for you to start sharing your story and I'll chip in as we go along if that's all right. Yeah, okay, will do. So um, I probably always wonder where to start with these things in terms of stories. Um, But I think probably to go back, especially because you mentioned the sewing factory. So probably to kind of go back with me leaving school and going to college. um, And I wanted to be a fashion designer. That was absolutely what I wanted to do. And for, you know, probably a couple of, I would say a couple of years before I left school, um, that's what I decided I wanted to do. So I took up art as GCSE um, and, you know, I'd be in my room of an evening with a scrapbook, cutting out pictures Mm -hmm. of the latest magazines of all the fashion. And, you know, it kind of consumed my life really at that point. Um, So I went on to do fashion design at the local college and um, enjoyed it. But then, you know, probably something we'll delve into a bit more detail as we go along is I started to become very independent. And it's a big motivator for me, something that's that's driven me pretty much all my career. Um, And so I probably started to feel independent at that point in that I wanted to start earning some money and being at college and doing fashion design I I kind of in that first year when I was there started to realize that this is something that I'm really going to have to go all in with if I wanted to 
to to make it in the world of fashion and it's not just these two years at college and then that'll be it and then you know a lifelong <laughs> jail or something it, you know it takes a lot of work and um, I was thinking I'm gonna have to move to a city I'm gonna have to probably go to university and um all that time and I was thinking about that and looking forward in my life I was thinking this is a lot of time where I'm not going to be earning my own money and that's what I wanted I wanted to have that independence um you know buy my own house and and start doing those kind of things so um after the first year I ended up leaving college but I still wanted to get into fashion somehow um and that's where I ended up in the sewing factory so I was an embroiderer Oh, wow. Um, and I did that for about, I think it was about three years I did that. And so I was on piecework. It, I was earning something like seven to eight K a year um, on piecework. I bought my first car when I was there for 250 pounds and um, actually bought my first house whilst I was working there. So I was 18 um, when I bought my first house. Really proud of that. Um, so I was proud of the things that I was achieving and that I could buy because I was earning money but not necessarily proud of the route that I'd taken I thought this working in a sewing factory for life definitely isn't for me I knew there was much more I could give um, and you know working on a on a, an embroidery machine you stood up all day you've got 17 heads that are embroidering all at the same time and so you know it's, it's quite a, a manual tiring and very loud job um so I kind of did that for three years and um really like I said just wanted to um knew that I had something more and I, and I could do more so um I ended up getting a job as a graphic designer um I know that's kind of seems like a bit of a leap going from working in a sewing factory to a graphic designer but because I'd done the work on Max at college um and I kind of had that creativity if you like that creative flair that's mm. how I get in the, the the job as a graphic designer well that makes complete sense to me that leap from one to the other actually but we can touch on that later I won't yeah. interrupt no no that's fine and you chip in whenever so um so yeah so I ended up uh, uh, then working as a graphic designer and uh, did that for about four years um and then I've didn't know at the time but have realized now going forward in my career that I do like change I like variety and I can get bored quite easily so four years um doing kind of the same thing by the time I could do it with my eyes closed I was bored um and wanted to do something different but at the time I kind of my confidence was low um you know I, I um I kind of really went into myself not like I was when I was at school I was quite confident at school and then I don't know I don't know if it was the working in that sewing factory that knocked my confidence a bit and then going into this other role it wasn't like a customer facing role it was a role where I pretty much looked at a, lap, a, a, a screen all day um, and you know wasn't very confident and so probably my confidence in getting another job wasn't quite there so I ended up going to a um, friend's body shop at home party and ended up becoming a body shop at home consultant. <laughs> I love this. Um, and I won't go into that too much because I'm pro that's probably going to come up in three weeks time when I talk about one of my pivotal moments. So I'm going right to people hanging there for episode three on that one. Um, but um but yeah, so that so I ended up doing that um, in my spare time, um, and then because of that, I got a job then as a um, area manager, area sales manager for Avon Cosmetics. So that was a full time job, oh, yeah. and um, I really felt like I was stepping up in that role. Um, I had a company car, my first company car that I'd ever had. Um, that was definitely something that I'd aspired to because I've always seen my dad have a company car and, you yeah. know, you aspire to these things that you see your parents um, doing and that. And so really felt like I'd made it at that point because I've like, got the company car, doing a job that I love like, in cosmetics, you know, um, and you know, I was in my early 20s at the time. Um, and so I, I had a patch, um, an area um, where I looked after any, anything between 380 to 400 Avon representatives wow. I had on my team. 
And uh, let me tell you, managing self-employed people really sets you up for managing employed people in the future. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whenever when I started managing people like later on and which I'll come to, um, if ever I was having a challenging time, I just think, remember what it was like when you were managing people that are self-employed. And if they wanted to sell some Avon products that month, they would. And if they didn't, then they wouldn't. But that <laughs> had an impact on my results. So that was quite interesting. And like I said, only in my early 20s doing that. Um, and so um Again, really enjoyed it. Um, and then I um, was talking to my friend one day on the phone and just saying, oh, I'm just getting a bit fed up in this job. And they're like, people are letting me down all the time. I'm getting really frustrated with people. And um, she was like, well, we've got a job here. And we think, you know, um, I think it'd really suit you. Why don't you come to see my manager and, and have an interview? I'll, I'll sort an interview out for you. And that was at Phones For You. Um, and so um, within about an hour of me being in the interview, I'd got the job um, working in the recruitment team at Phones For You. OK. So again, quite quite a leap, really, from being an area sales manager for Avon to then um, go and work at Phones For You and recruitment. But ultimately, my job within Avon, even though I was an area sales manager, yes, I was focused on the sales. But actually, I was recruiting reps. So I'd recruit probably 30 reps every three weeks. Um, and so because we worked on like a three week cycle because it's a cycle that the new Avon brochure comes out. Mm. So I was recruiting about 30 because uh, obviously from a retention point of view, you've got people that leave. You've got people that, that join each month. Um, so I was kind of used to the recruitment side of it as well. So um, that was my first kind of I would say proper managerial role because even though I was managing these 380 self-employed people this is where I was properly managing people that were employed um, and I had a small team of three at the time so I um, came into Phones For You and um, well I mean I'll probably mention Phones For You a few other times throughout uh, <laughs> its uh, podcast series because um, I was there for seven years so I know I'm fast forwarding a little bit now, but I absolutely loved it. Uh, and that's where I learned about creating a brilliant culture within an organisation and what benefits can be. Um, it's where I moved into training. So a few years into recruitment, um, a role came up in the training team. And again, me moving on, this is where I then started to move into something else. Every two years used to be my kind of itchy feet. Yeah to move on to something different so um i moved into the training team so that's where i started off really as a trainer although again transferable skills from working at avon when you recruit an avon representative you have to go around their house and so there's more one-to-one -one training on how to do it and what to do with your brochures and all that kind of stuff so um so yeah so uh, like i said i was there for seven years absolutely loved it loved the culture and you know, still now when I speak to people from Phone to View, I'm still friends with a lot of people that and friends that I made there. You know, we, we reminisce and we've always got a big smile on our faces and just oh. it, the fun that we had. And that's really where we learn about, you know, actually, and I'll come on to this uh, another time as well, when, when um, I thought about the phrase game of leadership and the word game, fun just immediately comes to my mind straight after the word yeah. game. And so, um, you know, absolutely. And that's where I learned a lot there um, in terms of how you can have fun at work, but still get the job done at the same time. So, as I said, moved into moved into the training team there and um, start off as a sales trainer. So I was delivering all the sales training to the consultants before they went to work in the stores. Um, and by the way, I'm just presuming that people know what phones for you is. It's start. I'm starting to feel a little good, bit. Off good point, time. Emma. Good point. <laughs> it's when been I, a while. Yeah, when I mentioned it to some people, they're like, "Phones for you? No." And I'm just like, "How can you not?" <laughs> there were 700 stores across the country, yeah. um, and then I realise actually, you know, we've not been there since 2014, and so good grief is it that we, long? Yeah. Wow. Um, so the best way to describe it really is that it was like Carphone Warehouse. So it sold mobile phones across all the networks 
um, and people know Carphone Warehouse because that still exists. So it was very similar to that um, and was known in the early days as very cutthroat sales um, and it, it it did change in the latter years and a lot of the training that I did was more rather than sales, 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 it was more about actually providing a great customer experience and if yeah. you do that the sales will come um so that was kind of the type of sales training that that i was doing um and then another role came up again after a couple of years of me doing the sales training in the management and development team and that's where i started delivering uh, training to all the managers uh, within Phones for You. So uh, whether that was our deputy managers, store managers at the time, and then maybe some managers within head office. Mm. Um, and so that's where I got into leadership development and I've not looked back ever since. And that's what I still do to this day. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's so brilliant. And um, so in that case, I don't know if I'm jumping a bit, so you feel free to come back. How does that lead you in then to inspired learning in your own business? Because now you're a leader of your, your own business. And I like to call it master of your own destiny. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Oh, master of my own destiny. There yeah. you go. <laughs> I, love I love it. I'm going to put that somewhere in my office. Um, so um, from Phones for You, so overnight, so for those of those people that can't remember, in 2014, September to be precise, um, we closed the stores overnight. Um, and so there's lots of uh, uh, stories out there and it's still going through some of the courts now, actually, in terms of why that closed. But um, it was basically some of the networks decided not to uh, work with us anymore. And obviously, when you've got a business model, that, that is based on selling to those selling from those networks so Vodafone uh, EE O2 um, well if they don't want to work with you anymore then you haven't got a business model yeah. so we closed the stores overnight and so I had to go into work on um, um, you know Monday morning at that time I actually had moved back into recruitment um, and that's a story in itself um, but um, I'd gone back into recruitment um, and I was managing a team of 23 at that point. Mm. So I had to go in onto that, you know, on that Monday morning and basically tell people to go home. And it was it was a horrendous morning. And we had the CEO was stood up on the table, you know, telling us, unfortunately, we've had to close the stores at this point. You know, it's about going home and then we'll contact you and let you know what's happening because you know, any any business like that at that point, you don't know if someone's going to come in and buy them out or, yeah. you know, we, we didn't know at that point what was going to happen. Um, and so I had a phone call on that Monday. And as you can imagine, it hit the press straight away on that Monday. So everybody knew um, you're potentially going to have 7,000 people out of work. And mm -hmm. Phones for was very, very well known for... Um, if you have worked for Phones for You at a long time, for a long time, you've got to be a certain type of person. It's either for you or it isn't. And that's kind of strong will, tenacious, yeah. um, you know, hard working. Um, but someone that it's, it was very much a work hard, play hard ethos, which, yeah. you know, I still still work to to this day. Um so people out there knew that actually there's some amazing people there at Phones for You. So all our phones, like my LinkedIn, uh, my emails were just going wild on this day because we had all recruitment agencies were like, brilliant, it's like Christmas. Yeah. We've got all these people, um, you know, and that's obviously not a brilliant situation for everyone, but yeah. they were up taking advantage of that. So I had a phone call from a healthcare company and... Um, they said, look, you know, we'd like you to come for an interview. We've got lots of exciting things happening here and um, we'd like to come along and, and, and f to, you know, for an interview and see, let us explain what's going on. So I said, oh, because they want to see me that afternoon. <laughs> I just didn't feel ready for it. I, thought, I haven't even processed it yet. Just give me five minutes. <laughs> absolutely. And for me as a leader, actually, at that point, you know, I was putting my feelings to one side because my team came first and foremost. Yeah. And, you know, I was thinking about them and, you know, I'm big 
lover of Simon Sinek and when you talk about his book Leaders Eat Last you know it's about yeah. my team come before me and so I needed to sort them out I also had to a list of candidates to ring to say we won't be pro progressing with your application mm -hmm. who were meant to be turning up for maybe for interviews that day or the next day um and I and I could have done that with my team got my team to do those phone calls um because historically you know that's what they would have done they looked after their own area um mm. but they were in the right mind, mind frame and so i said no we sent the team home and it was me and a few other managers and the head of recruitment we stayed and made those phone calls to those candidates so i was like look i can't come for an interview today you know um it, it, that's not going to happen can i come tomorrow so nine o'clock the next day just so surreal i didn't expect like on the sunday evening that week to be sitting somewhere different and having an interview on a tuesday um yeah. by about 9 30 the person that had interviewed me offered me the job um and at that point i can remember saying oh do you not want to um have a look at my cv i've not even got it out of my bag at that point yet and he said no he said you've been at phones for you for seven years that's all i need to know if you can stay there for seven years then i know you 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 you'd be great for the job so i was like okay um Fantastic. and so he showed me around an empty building we hadn't even uh, got the keys at that point um so it was literally she'd been shown in through the window uh, there was no furniture obviously no people nothing and what had happened is they decided to centralize the recruitment function so rather than having they had recruiters across the country um they decided to create a function of a team of 75 um mm -hmm. in this building and head office was just across the, the road um so this was for a healthcare company so again it, still recruitment but a leap from retail to yeah. healthcare very different and it's only making me realise now talking to you that I have had huge like leaps from one thing to another. Um, and so basically that's what I was recruited for to um, bring people in and recruit a team of 75 um, to come on board and, and build this recruitment team. Um, and so again, a surreal moment when on the Thursday, I was in one of their meeting rooms interviewing my own team from Phones For You to come and join me <laughs> um, in this recruitment. Because I thought if I've got 75 people to recruit, well, I want to, I want my good, the good members in my team to come over yeah. and join me. Um, yeah. Before they, and it, we had to do it very quickly because we knew that recruiters were trying to recruit them uh, for uh, you know elsewhere so that happened and um you know we uh obviously brought some more managers in at the time and then a, a head of recruitment who was the head of recruitment for phones for you she came and joined who actually is my best friend um she was at the time she's the person that originally called me and said come along and get this job at phones for yeah. you so we kind of followed each other to different places and then so we set up this recruitment team we brought that i'd like to think that culture with us and i'm going to talk more about that in the next episode around how i kind of bring that fun element to my team yeah yeah um and then so i'm nearly there at the inspired learning part so moved into that healthcare business and a couple of years on moved again but not but within the same business so not externally um a role in uh, l and uh, learning development was created for me uh, because they didn't have anybody looking after the management and leadership there um, so I moved into that role because I was really getting a hankering for getting back into l and at that point really missing it um, because that's really where my passion is that's why I get up and out of bed in the morning so um, I moved into in, into the training team there so I had a team of eight people within the training team um, and then moved into my last corporate role, which was a huge facilities management company called InterServe. Um, had the part of the business that I worked for had 55,000 employees. And when I joined, there was, I was one of three learning and development managers there for 55,000 employees. Um, and unfortunately, sorry. Goodness me, I said that. Just goes to show, doesn't it? <laughs> 
how it can be so undervalued. Absolutely. And bear in mind, I moved what I was used to at Phones for You. Our training team was about a team of 35 for 7,000 employees. So, you know, moving into that. And, and unfortunately, about a year into my role, the other two learning development managers were made redundant. So okay. there was only me. Um, I had head of head of L and D, and we had trainers that delivered um, kind of the because it was uh, facilities management, clean and operative, security officers. So mm -hmm. they did that type of training, but I was the only one there for looking after management and leadership. Um, and so this is where I'm coming now into to starting inspired learning because I kind of felt like. Um, I was falling out of love with learning and development at one point when I was there because um, I wasn't doing much of the training. As you can imagine, I can't do it all for 55,000 people. So we used a lot of external uh, trading companies that came in to deliver certain topics. So I, I would be managing all that. So I almost felt like I'd become a bit of a kind of glamorous project manager rather than actually a learning development and you've been in the room seeing those light bulb moments and yeah. you know actually being there to develop people I, mean, I was really missing it and I wasn't managing a team at the time so I was thinking I'm missing one of two things I, I don't need both of these but I'm definitely missing having one of them at least which is either being back in the room and training people again or managing a team again yeah. Um, and I thought I need to move on and do one of those things again. Um, and I was doing some training, but when I was in a room with 12 people or, you know, 12 to 16 people doing the training, I'm always in, that was on my mind was there's 55,000 people in this company. I don't I can't see the difference that I'm making. Um, and I just feel like what I'm doing now is just, a, you know, a dip in the ocean. And it, it was just you couldn't see. um I probably didn't see those people again after that one day that I had chance to spend with them. And for me, it's about that job satisfaction is really about seeing people develop. So anyway, I thought at the time, I thought, right, I'm either going to go and get an, a look for a head of role. So I am actually um, leading people, leading a team of people again. Or hmm, maybe I could go and set up my own business and do get back in the room with people. Get a piece um, of the pie, Emma. Sorry. <laughs> get a piece of the freelance pie. Exactly. You know, and and you know, not to be disrespectful to the traits some of the trainers that we were using, but I was sat in the room sometimes when I used to go in and observe the sessions, thinking, we're paying this person to do this, and I could be doing this. You know, like I say, it's not no disrespect to them, but I'm thinking I want to be there doing what they're doing. But I couldn't within that company because there was only me with so many, so many, uh, you know, um, employees. Mm. So I thought, yeah, like you said, bit of that freelance pie. And um, yeah, why not give it a go? And it was a big risk at the time. Yeah. You know, I, I was it was a well paid job. Again, I had a nice company car um, and actually the main earner between me and my partner in the house. So, you know, a big risk if it didn't work out financially, but there was just something in me that I thought is now or never. And if I don't give it a try, I'm just gonna always go on wondering what if I didn't. And um, yeah, I, I kind of, I can remember giving the keys to my company car back. I don't know why that was it. That was a key thing for me. It's like, oh, yeah, you've mentioned it a few times throughout, but I totally yeah. get that seeing your dad have the company car, being the main breadwinner. Yeah, yeah I, I feel that influence in my life as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, it was just like, oh, this is it. I'm really doing it now. It just made it be, like become reality, really. Um, you know, and thinking I'm going to wake up tomorrow or Monday morning at least with an empty diary. What do I do now? You know, it's like, okay. Now I am really the master of my own destiny. Um, <laughs> and, so, um, and so, yeah, Inspired Learning was born and, and, and that's it. And that was four and a half years ago now. Oh, that's so fantastic. It's, you know, and such a great, great story of how you've, how you've come into that. But I suppose the bits that, that I'm curious about, Emma, is 
you know, where have those influences come from um, over the years? One, in terms of your creative streak, because clearly that's that's running beautifully through everything you've just shared and that that desire to be looking for the next thing um, to, to keep you occupied and engaged and keep the creative mind going. But, uh, you know, also in terms of that sort of that leadership inspiration as well. Mm -hmm. OK, well, so with the creative side, um, I actually deliver creative thinking workshops. And what I talk about a lot on those workshops is how we are inspired by things that are around us. So if you're sat at the same desk, you know, for 20 years, looking yeah. at the same things around you, seeing the same thing out of the window, you're just going to keep on generating the same ideas over and over again. So even if you have the same desk in the same room, you know, in the same office, put some different things around, you know, and actually, you know, if you've got a picture frame, change the picture every three months or whatever. Put some new things around you so you've got a different environment. So, you know, that that's kind of one small thing that you can do. But also take yourself away from that space. I love nothing more than going to like a coffee shop that I've never been to before with a notebook and pen, no technology and just watching the world go by and just kind of freestyle journaling and writing anything that comes to mind um and when you're in a relaxed mindset mm -hmm. you are more creative aren't you, you, are. you know? and I, I kind of learned this when i started um in fact i was going to say when i started going going away in cottages in this country but that was kind of probably a second thing the first time was when and this is a very rare occasion for me i'm I'm, I'm very well known for never being sick and never taking time off work but there's one occasion where I was and it was probably three or four days I had off and I've been very busy at work it's probably why I was off ill because I'd kind of pushed myself too much yeah. um, and all of a sudden just because I was sat at home and with nothing to do just all these ideas for these projects I was working on just started coming to my mind. And I just ended up, you know, I was at home ill, but making loads of notes and brainstorming and getting loads of things down. And I so suddenly realised that it's because I'm not getting an email every two seconds. I'm not having to pick the phone up every five minutes or, you know, thinking about all the other tasks that I've got to do. I'm, I'm in a relaxed state. And so that was probably the first time I realised that. And then as I said, going in, going to cottages and spending time away, I used to take, and I still do sometimes now, um, an A3 uh, pad, notepad, coloured pens, love doing this, uh, because I know that when I go away, I'm in that relaxed state and I'm all of a sudden going to get a burst of inspiration that comes to me. Um, and so... I'd much prefer to just, you know, I know a lot of people be like, well, I'm on a holiday. I'm not doing that. That's work. But actually, I love doing that because it otherwise I would be holding on to it in my head for the week until I got home. And so yeah. just get it out on paper um, really helps. So being in that relaxed mind mindset, I've done a lot of that over the years. Um, but also, I think, oh, as I was saying, the things that we just do in our day to day life, we are inspired by. And so I think probably looking back because of even in my childhood, my background and how much I've moved around. And then because I have worked for different organisations, it's almost like as I go along in my life, I'm picking up golden nuggets and I kind of put them away and it might not be the right time now but I've kind of picked these up from people which I'll come on to because uh, I know you've asked about that but um from people from just seeing different things you know I'd moved house eight times by the age of 10 um mm -hmm. and so and in two different countries uh mm -hmm. so in France and in England and so I think just just being out there and experiencing different things yeah. creates that creativity. So I think there's definitely that. And I do have a curious mind. I know this is a podcast for the curious leader. I do have a curious <laughs> mind. So whenever I meet anybody that's very different, especially people that are very different to me, I love it because I know I'm going to learn something different from them. And, you know, and this is where having a diverse workforce is so important. 
but actually being open minded to different ideas and opinions because that's how we learn. If everybody was exactly the same as me, I would never learn anything. And so, and you know, I know when I come on within a few minutes, not just a um, couple of years, you know, it would be a very dull, mm -hmm. boring, uncolorful, uncreative world, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I know that I'm going to learn so much from other people. And, you know, whenever I meet anyone, it's, you know, whether it's just where their thoughts and ideas come from or their culture or whatever it might be, I'm going to take away, you know, one or maybe more of those golden nuggets that, that I can use in my creativity. Yeah, I love that idea of collecting golden nuggets. Um, I might not have called it that, but I certainly do the same. There are little gems that you pick up along the way and just pop in that inside pocket for a time when it's just the right time. And you always know because you can feel it, can't you? When's the right time to, to dig in for that thing somewhere back in the memory that you know you've stored for future use. I love that. I can remember actually when I was younger, I used to get really frustrated with my manager because I'd be coming up with all these new ideas and manager would be like, oh no, we're not ready for that yet, Emma, or we haven't got the budget for that, or logistically that's not going to work. And I used to be really frustrated because I think I've come up with a really good idea there. Um, so I used to have a box called ideas <laughs> that I just used to write them down on a piece of paper and put them in this box thinking, I don't want to lose that idea, so I'm going to yeah. put it box um but yeah i can remember that and um you know is it is like you said it might not be the right time now but it's good to good to pick up and remember those and um you know it might just be me walking down the street and there might be something that my brain picks up and that's why things like mindfulness walking i'm a big advocate mm -hmm. of that is leaving the phone at home and actually putting the effort in to walk walk somewhere and notice everything that's around you because our brain only picks up so many bits of information so if you've got your phone in your hand it's going to be deleting everything that's around you so big absolutely you can set yourself targets can't you i want to find 10 snails on this walk or or 10 different types of leaf on this walk whatever it might be because it, you're absolutely right it really heightens your awareness and having, you know, coming at that walk, for example, with a curious approach, what can I find today? What are the different things I'm going to come up with? And, you know, taking a mental note, it's a whole different way of disengaging from the techni technology that's constantly bombarding us these days and allowing us to truly decompress Mm -hmm. which is quite rare that we get time to do so it's great absolutely absolutely and you know I I, I know it became a bit of a, a habit I re realized that I was saying it a lot to my team when I was leading teams I'd come into work and I'm, I'm like right I've got this brilliant idea I've come up with it this morning while I was in the shower or while I was brushing my teeth I always come up with ideas when I'm not forced to think of ideas yeah and so sometimes we force that creativity and we don't allow time for it and so um, it, it's actually a, a, one of the exercises that I do sometimes in my workshops as a bit of a game where I get people to um, list a mode of transport anything that gets you from A to B um, and we go around once and the first person I guarantee you will always say car yeah of course <laughs> and then they'll say things like train plane bus and I'll say right they're all boring yeah, they're all the first things that come to mind. There's so many things, so many ways that you can get from A to B. So we'll actually, I'll get everyone to stand up if we are face to face and um, keep on going round. And nobody can repeat anything anyone else has said. And if you can't think of anything, you're out and you sit yeah. down. And we keep on going round and round. And, you know, we've had all sorts of had magic flying carpets. We've had dolphins. <laughs> We've had space rockets, but the, the, the message is that creativity takes time. And the more we think about it, the more creative we'll be. But actually when we're in back-to-back -back meetings, you know, we'll come, in, come into a meeting and we'll say, right, we need to think about some ideas for X. And, um, you know, you might come up with the idea, I'll say, Paula, what's your idea? And you'll share it and be like, okay, that's great. Let's get it down. One more person in the room might share it. And then, by that time, I'm looking at my watch thinking, am I, I either need to be on another team's call or, um, 
uh, we need to move on to the next item of the agenda. And so actually, what about all those other people that we've not included um, that may be sitting there and haven't been asked? So mm -hmm. you know, it's about making sure what I say to leaders is, if you're going into a meeting chair in a meeting where you need the team to come up with fresh ideas, you need to put sufficient time in for that and not just go with the first ideas that come out. You're absolutely right. Look, Emma, we've gone massively over time, but it's been so, so worth it for this first episode, much longer than we normally spend and, and just fabulous hearing your stories. So I'm going to hang on there and hold on because we're going to tip into our next episode when we next speak um, where we'll be looking at your ideas around game and leadership and I will come back to the the people that have inspired you and perhaps we'll 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 touch on that for episode three with you so thank you so so much for sharing everything you've shared um, so far and I can't wait to talk to you next week brilliant see you next week thanks Paula cheers Emma Thank you for listening to today's episode of Game of Leadership, the podcast for curious leaders. Today, we listen to the leadership journey of our guest and how they got to be where they are today. Now, in the chats, we talked about all sorts of different things, and there are lots of bits and pieces in there that are going to mean something different to each and every one of you. You will all have your own unique takeaways. So I encourage you to do a bit of reflection now and see what this might mean for your leadership moving forwards. I'm Paul Eddie Wilcox, and I look forward to seeing you on Game of Leadership, a podcast for curious leaders next week. Bye for now.